months ago, we were at a board meeting, and we're always looking for speakers. So if any of you in the audience have a, a speaker that you think would be of interest, please let me know. And Eileen McCormick, who is the curator of our museum and sitting right there, mentioned that she had a cousin who was involved in vintage baseball. And I said, baseball? Historical? I, I don't get it. And she said, no, 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 it's, it's terrific. It's a whole group of people who uh, replicate what baseball was like way, way back. So I looked into it, and I did have an opportunity to attend a vintage baseball game at the um, Monmouth Battleground. And it's fantastic. It's a wonderful trip back to history. So tonight we have uh, our aficionado. He's going to tell you all about vintage baseball or old time baseball, um, how he got started in it, the uniforms, where they play, and he's going to take us back in, in time. So I'd like you all now to welcome Russ McKeever, who's going to speak, be our speaker for this evening. Russ, come on. Okay, thank you everyone for coming out. Thank you to the Historical Society. I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, let's start with a, a little bit of a test, test, a quiz, something fun, just to see the, um, get the baseball historical acumen of all of you. Um, first, let's address the, uh, the elephant in the room. Uh, first question, uh, what major league team still uses the elephant as their mascot? A's. There you go. Okay. That's a modern question. Let's go back a little further. Um, th this is actually a little a little tougher. Okay. This hat is from a major league team in New Jersey. There's an N on it. Can anyone tell me the town? Newark. 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 Now, Newark since you know it's Newark, the Bears. No. This is it. Now here we go. Newark. The year was 1915. There was a league, a third major league called the Federal League. And in the Federal League, there was a team called the Newark Peppers. New Jersey's only major league team. Their field was where the uh, Garfield Station is on New Jersey Transit. So next time you go to New York City and you're driving when you pass the Garfield Station, you are riding on the site of an old major league field. Now, they only played there for a year. The league only survived for two. In uh, 1916, the Federal League was put out of business, and part of the residual of them being put out of business was a lot of the reason you hear about the uh, antitrust exemption that Major League Baseball has. The, uh, the Federal League's disillusion was the... Um, origin of the Major League Antitrust Exemption. So this was the, the Newark Peppers. So if anyone ever says about there never, never being a Major League team in New Jersey, you can say, yes, there was, the 1915 Newark Peppers. And finally, and I'm not going to give you the whole answer to this, but the uniform I'm wearing. Can you tell me the team? Brooklyn. Brooklyn what? The Brooklyn what? Elite. What did you say? The elites? I said elites. No. Okay. It, it, it was not not the Brooklyn Dodgers, but it, you you will you well they, it was the Brooklyn Dodgers, but they weren't called the Dodgers in this. I, my name is Russ McKeever, and uh, just to kind of give you um, an idea where I'm coming from, um, about three years ago, I uh, decided that um, I wanted to explore my passion for history, just general history. I'm I'm six credit short from a double major in economics and history. My father. My senior year of college wouldn't let me take the extra six credits because he knew that we'd need another semester at Rutgers. And later on, and like I said, three years ago, I decided to uh, explore my passion for history, and I got involved with Alaire Village down in uh, Wall Township, which you all know. And um, I became uh, involved in the uh, reenactment and interpretation there. And what happened was, um, as an adult, I saw a lot of the uh, people playing games. They were playing um, uh, uh, graces, and they were on pogo sticks and stilts and things like that. And I said, wouldn't it be nice if there was something that adults could be involved in? So I started doing some research, and I discovered 
that um, in the 1830s, they played a game called Town Wall. And specifically, uh, the version was uh, 1831 Philadelphia Town Wall. The rules were quite different. You wouldn't really recognize it so much as uh, you would modern baseball. And um, they let me set that up in the village, and it actually became quite popular. So what they did is they um, said, you can um, expand that if you'd like. We'd like to see if maybe you'd be interested in trying to reenact some early baseball. And so from that, I was introduced to the vintage baseball community. Anyway, so let's get started. So first presentation is Bob Iron Baseball, the 1898 Brooklyn Bridegrooms. It was the Bridegrooms uniform. The Brooklyn Bridegrooms spring training at LA. Now, how did I find out about this? In the process of uh, developing the town ball and baseball at Alaire, um, someone mentioned to me, oh, the Brooklynites trained here in 1898. Now, who were the Brooklynites? Now, being a, you know, being a baseball aficionado, I knew there wasn't a team called the Brooklynites. So, so <clears throat> let's talk about the Brooklyn Bridegrooms, Brooklyn Baseball in New York City. Okay? Um, baseball was pretty much defunct in the 1880s in Brooklyn. Um, however, baseball started to become popular um, through the National, there, were, there was a league called the National Association and the American Association and the National League. And there was interest in Brooklyn in starting a new team. So, Charles Byrne, he was a, uh, a local uh, accountant actually in Brooklyn, decided he wanted to start a team in Brooklyn got together with his brother-in-law, George Taylor, and the money man was a guy named Ferdinand and Bell. And in 1884, as you can see, they played, they first started out, they were the Brooklyn Atlantic, so they were a minor league team. <coughs> and then they played as the Brooklyn Braves. And then they decided to take it big time and join the American Association as the Bridegrooms. So in 1889, they became the champions of the American Association, and at that point they decided they wanted to become members of the National League. So, Charlie Byrne again was an interesting character, he, and this kind of plays into our story. He was very involved in the theater community in New York. Now, his um, his, his role there, he was a backer of uh, a, few, uh, a few shows. Um, he also wanted to bring up the, um, the reputation of baseball players and introduce them to the theater and the finer points of life. Um, and he was considered one of the top, he referred to baseball owners back in the 19th century as magnets or magnates. And he was considered the first among many of the baseball magnets. So here's where the story gets interesting. In 1898, in January, Charlie Byrne passes away. He dies of Bright's disease. And in the uh, 1890s, um, baseball was very fluid. It wasn't like it was today. You didn't have um, franchises uh, stable and kind of set in their ways. They were always rating each other for players. So the, the bridegrooms at that point were looking for a place to train for the 1898 season. So the first thing they needed to do was they needed to find a, um, someone to run the team. And the person that took the reins was someone you probably know, was Charlie Evans. So he was with the team from the beginning, and um, by 1898 he was in a position to assume the presidency. So the first thing he needed to do again was to find a, find a place to train. So. Where he decided to train was at LA. Yeah. Yeah. So it wasn't like today where they went to Florida. They <laughs> kind of kept local. But the question is, why did they come to a They could have gone just about anywhere. Here you had a lair out in the middle of the firm. Now Charlie Byrne, as I said, was very interested in the theater. Um, at a lair, you're familiar with the story of the lair and James P. Allaire, uh, 
the, uh, the iron monger, and his son, Hal, owned the property at the time. So he needed a way to develop the property. Now the question is, is how did the connection between Allaire and Charlie Byrne happen? Well, there's a couple of theories that I have for that. And that is, number one, that Charlie Byrne and Hal Allaire may have been associates because of the New York theater. And when Charlie Byrne died, Char uh, Charles Ebbets, knowing of the association, may have approached Hal Allaire and said, hey, we know you have this property down in Monmouth County. Would you like to bring your team in? Okay. Now, another theory is, is there was a Lakewood uh, druggist, actually it was a state senator, uh, named Will Harrison. Now, he had the mortgage on the property, so he wanted to make money. Now, what I'd like to believe is the first theory that Charlie Byrne and Hal Allaire knew, knew each other, and um, Hal Allaire was doing a favor for his old friend Charlie. Now, we go on to the, the spring training location at Allaire, and this is where um, us as fellow historians can kind of look out and see the, the landscape of where we live and where we go and kind of you have that eye where you look into the past. Well, um, I know when you go to Allaire, you might think 1830s and that type of thing, but when I go to Allaire, knowing what I know now, I know of several places at Allaire that actually were part of this activity in 1898. Specifically, this was the coal house. This is where they kept the raw materials for the furnace. The carpenter shop. Oh, is it, has anyone not been to Allaire, by the way? The carpenter shop. Okay. And then also, this field right here. Are you familiar with this field? This is where they have the flea markets now. You know this field? Okay. So these three places actually play into the story. First of all, the, the concept of spring training in those days wasn't like it is now where the teams play other major league teams or play college teams or that type of thing. For the most part, the games that they played were intramural, intra-squad. Um, there was some discussion in 1898 in the uh, papers that they would possibly uh, get a chance to play the Giants, but that actually was um, that actually was discouraged because as it turned out, as, as you probably know your history, the Giants were in Lakewood and Lakewood was the place to be. Okay, so <coughs> given the way the game was then, they didn't want the, um, the Brooklyn team to be corrupted by the activities of, <laughs> of the Giants. Although we do have some indications that there were a few players that snuck away to Lakewood from, from time to time. Um, needless to say, they were only there for about a month. Um, the weather was terrible, so it probably would have been just as well if the whole team just went to Lakewood and had a big party. For them. <laughs> so, so now we get to the property. Remember I said the coal shed? So <clears throat> they, um, one thing that Charlie Evans did is he uh, hired Princeton's track coach, a guy named Jack McMasters, to train the team. And they put them to work. And this is actually a uh, drawing from the Cincinnati Inquirer um, of, the, uh, of the activities of the Brooklyn team in the coal shed. Now the coal shed does not exist anymore. You probably just know it as that patio. But that's the building that they use for the inside dream. Now, more um, appropriate, or to get a better idea of looking at something and thinking about how it was in the past, is the carpenter shop. Now, you're all familiar with the carpenter shop. This is, you know, one of the things you, you know, <clears throat> have to see along with the blacksmith shop and the uh, and uh, Allaire's Mansion, all right? But this was actually the place where the players had their meals. There was a gentleman 
named Delisle, who had his restaurant there. And one of the features of the team being at Allaire is that they were um, catered, their, their meals were there. And we actually have visual evidence of it. Because we have this. That's the carpenter shop. This is from the Brooklyn Eagle. And here's a guy dressed just like me out in front of the carpenter shop. So now we don't have any photographs, at least none that I'm aware of, any, any of this activity out of there. But we have something that has a building that is still there and we know about. And in your mind's eye, you can imagine these folks back there in March of 1898. And then finally, we have the field. Well, this is actually the field in front of the chapel. If you imagine this, the chapel's right over here. Okay, maybe where the flag is. The river is right beyond this fence. Okay, and the road that you walk past wasn't really, wasn't there then. Um, but next time you're there, if you look at that field, now there's trees that have grown up there. And I've actually tried to play baseball there. It does not work. <laughs> if you hit the ball, the ball comes right back at you, believe me. But that was the field that they practiced on. And this is a picture of them practicing on that field in front of the chapel. And that was the, uh, that's, that's the team that actually went to Allaire. They all dressed like me. Right, that's the, the Brooklyn Bridegrooms of 1898. And then some of, my, uh, some of my favorite players of the Brooklyn Bridegrooms. Um, this guy's perhaps my favorite. This was uh, Rickyard Kennedy. He was a, uh, a pitcher, um, probably, probably borderline Hall of Fame quality. Uh, one of, the, um, one of the, his, his attributes player-wise was that he had a habit um, in his career of matching up pretty well against a guy named Cy Young. As a matter of fact, um, as a member of the uh, Pittsburgh Pirates uh, back in um, 1903 in the first World Series, he got a chance to, uh, to face him. And there's, there's this guy, Fielder Jones, who, first of all, that's his name. Okay, now if you're born into something, and your name is Fielder, thank God there's baseball. Um, now he was, he, had, he actually had a pretty interesting career. He was, for the 1898 Bridegrooms, he was one of their up-and-coming players. He was a, uh, <clears throat> he was a, a, sh a shortstop initially, um, was always a very good hitter, but as he got um, more involved in baseball, he got more involved in the, in the management of baseball, and uh, as you can see here, you know his, his regular statistics. But in the early 20th century, he became a player manager with the White Sox, and he eventually wanted to become an owner. And he actually got a chance to be an owner. You see at the bottom, he managed the St. Louis Terriers again of the Federal League in 1914 and 1915, and then when that league folded. He was able to take his shares as part of the settlement of the collapse of the Federal League and became a part owner of the St. Louis Cardinals. Then there's Jack Dunn. Now, Jack Dunn, even though he's wearing a glove, was actually one of the last barehanded players. Um, if you go to uh, Baltimore, his name is all over the place. Uh, the Dunn family was very prevalent in um, baseball in Baltimore. And as you can see, one of the things he did after his playing career, recruiting for his team, he found a left-handed shortstop at uh, St. Mary's Academy named Babe Ruth. And again, one of the reasons, that, so he, he actually was the one who sold Babe Ruth to the Red Sox. And he, this happened in 1914 and the way he leveraged the sale to the Boston Red Sox was he threatened to sell Babe Ruth to the Baltimore team of, again, the Federal League. So in 1898, that's as far as the season goes, we have uh, 
can, can you a chance? This was a miserable team. Struck out more than anyone in the National League. Um, uh, Field of Jones was good. The pitching was the pitching was pretty good. Um, Mike Griffin, another another borderline Hall of Famer, um, also a, became a very successful manager. Um, he was around for a while, but on, on the whole, the team did not do all that well in eighteen ninety. So the eighteen ninety eight season ended, and um, here, here's what happened. Like I told you, baseball in the late 20th or late 19th century was very fluid. Um, you had a lot of consolidation. Um, the Brooklyn team and the Baltimore team had some common ownership. And what happened was is the Baltimore Orioles, basically the owners bought majority interest in the Brooklyn team. Still involved Charlie Evans, but bought majority ownership of the Brooklyn team and brought all their good players over to Brooklyn. And lo and behold, the uh, Brooklyn team won in 1899. And consequently, that destroyed the first edition of the Baltimore Orioles. It's the first edition, just been more than one. Oh, and by the way, when they, when they were purchased, they changed the name of the bridegrooms to the Superbas, <laughs> after Hamlet's Superbas, which was a, uh, a Broadway show that had not, no, no relation to, to Hamlet. And basically what, you know, what, I, what I like to think of with the, um, the situation of Allaire is that the team was, uh, was somewhat in flux. Um, I mean, in 1899, they kind of, got taken over by the ownership of the Orioles, but they could have been disbanded as well. And you know, I, I like to think that because of Allaire in 1898, you wouldn't have had someone like Casey Stengel, who started as a, as a Brooklyn player, and as you know, was a big part of the Brooklyn Yankees rivalry. He would have been playing for Brooklyn. He would have been playing someplace else. That's Jackie Robinson. He probably would have been playing for Cincinnati. So that was the that was the uh, the Brooklyn bridegroom story at Allaire. Now, next presentation. You know, he's saying Friedman we trust. Okay, the Red Bank conspiracy that shaped modern baseball. I introduce to you Mr. Andrew Friedman. He was born in 1860 in New York. He became, uh, <clears throat> after graduating college, he actually got involved with Tammany Hall and became um, quite wealthy uh, managing some of their activities. If any of you are familiar with the way Tammany Hall operated, if uh, you, were, you were in, um, there was a lot of uh, money to be made. He actually became a uh, close associate of Dean uh, Crawford, who was, uh, after uh, Boss Tweedy, um, one of the more notorious um, uh, people involved with Tammany Hall. So in the late 1880s, he was looking for some way to entertain himself, and he managed to take uh, ownership of the New York Giants. Everything was everything was fine for um, a few years until the mid 1890s when things started to get a little troublesome for Mr. Friedman. And one of the first things that happened was um, this gentleman here, Amos Rusi, who was a pitcher for the Giants and probably um, one of the uh, fastest throwers in baseball. As a matter of fact, he is responsible for the fact that the pitcher's mound is 60 foot 6 inches from home plate. It used to be 45 feet. But Amos Rusi threw so hard that they determined that they really should start thinking about 
moving the pictures down back. Well, in 1896, Amos Rusi was fined on two separate occasions $100. So, $200. And he didn't want to pay the fine. So, instead of paying the fine, what Amos Rusi did was he decided to hold out for the entire year. So, this made Andrew Friedman quite upset. What Andrew Friedman did is Andrew Friedman decided to say, fine, you don't want to be involved, I don't want anything to do with you. The problem was, is that the other teams in the National League, without the drawing card of Amos Rusi, were not making as much money when the Giants came to town. So the other teams got together and pitched in to pay Amos Rusi's salary. Now, needless to say, Andrew Friedman was upset about that. So he said, fine. Amos Rusi came back. So what he decided to do, he decided to do two things. First thing he did was, and this kind of rings true to a, a guy that we knew from about 20 years ago, is he started firing his managers and training his players to try to put the worst team on the field, to try to prove to the other National League teams the power that the Giants had, all because of... So, consequently, Amos, the, the Giants were doing terrible, and Andrew Friedman decided to kind of step away and just kind of let everything play out while he did other things. And then another situation came up that kind of made Andrew Friedman's uh, situation even more nefarious or suspect. And that has to do with, well, maybe not nefarious, but it kind of, it kind of gave him, kind of gave him some, some idea of where he was coming from and maybe how he felt about the way things were back in the 1890s. And that has to do with this gentleman here, James Ducky Holmes. James, James Holmes was a, one of the giants that Andrew Friedman treated. And he was in Baltimore playing, or he, they, he kept, Baltimore came into uh, New York in 1897. And Ducky was having a particularly bad game. He, was, he struck out a couple of times. The fans were um, giving him a hard time. So on his way back to the bench, Ducky made an anti-Semitic remark to Andrew Friedman, who happened to be Jewish. And Andrew Friedman basically jumped out of the stands and went after Ducky Holmes and pulled the Giants off the field, forfeited the game, said any game we play against the Orioles will be forfeited. I don't want anything to do with it. Well, what happened was, is the uh, after that game, obviously, you know, Friedman had some reason to be upset, but what the National League did is um, they, they basically refused Friedman's um, uh, wishes of uh, games being uh, under protest and them not playing the Orioles. They reinstated Duffy Holmes. So he has to say, Friedman was livid, and now Friedman had it out for nationally. That brings up <clears throat> this next, next gentleman, John T. Brush. Okay, now John T. Brush was another owner of the, of the National League. His team at the time while this was going on was the Cincinnati Reds. But John T. Brush was more of a baseball man and had some thoughts about running baseball as a business. So what John T. Brush wanted to do was run baseball as a syndicate. So he got together with Andrew Friedman and they talked about this. They tried to get a um, basically a monopoly of the National League. Now this is where the Red Bank connection comes. Andrew Friedman's home is a state 
was on Tower Hill in Red Bank. You guys know where that is? All right, that was his, that was his home from about 1890 to um, 1915. And in 1901, they had a secret meeting there where they tried to plot to take over the National League. They were going to basically take all the teams and put them under one organization and then split the profits between a, a, a core group of owners with the rest of the owners just kind of left with the leavings. Um, but as it turned out, they could not get a majority. And the reason for that was this guy, Albert G. Spaulding. Now you probably know, you've heard of Spaulding. Okay? Spaulding was a, an old, was a baseball player in the late 19th century, and uh, at this point he also was a, a sporting goods magnet. And um, he got wind of the plan to, uh, to take, over, um, take over the National League and made sure that Brush and Friedman could not get a majority. So their plan their plan was foiled, but little did they know that in the background, Albert G. Spaulding was working with this guy here, Van Johnson. And what Van Johnson did is Van Johnson had the Western League. And the Western League, Spaulding had in mind to become a second major league, which we now know as the American. Basically, you had, so in 1901, after the, the foiling of the, um, the takeover of the National League, you had the beginnings of the um, American League. Now, back to Andrew Friedman, interesting, interestingly, he had a hand, as it turned out, in the founding of the American League and another New York team. Here's how it worked. So he got together with John T. Brush, and he sold his interest in the, um, in the New York Giants. So John T. Brush became the owner of the New York Giants. And if any of you uh, had ever been to the polo grounds or are familiar with um, the uh, northeast side of Manhattan, there actually is the John T. Brush steps, which are still there that lead up to Kubin's Bluff. So he sold the Giants to, um, to John T. Brush, and with the, with the proceeds, Andrew Friedman purchased the American League version of the Baltimore Orioles. Now everyone knows, or a lot of baseball fans know, what happened to the Baltimore Orioles in 1903. They moved to the Bronx and became the Highlanders. Now, he sold his interest before they went to New York. So, Andrew Friedman, who lived in Red Bank, was an owner of the New York Giants and also of the team that became the New York Yankees. So, <coughs> That was the story behind Andrew Friedman. Now, Andrew pretty much divested himself out of baseball probably about, about 1905, and he went on to uh, other um, business uh, ventures. Um, one of the, uh, the things that is his legacy is the New York subway. Involved in the financing and the building of the New York subway. He was also um, the underwriter for, uh, for the Wright brothers um, and their aircraft manufacturer. And um, they're actually, when, when he died, he never married, he never had any children, but he took his fortune and he established a home in the Bronx for, this is going to sound like a weird statement, for indigent rich people. Basically, people who had lost their fortunes but were used to um, having all the accoutrement of, of being, being rich and being catered to. 
And that, that building still exists today. Um, on the left side of the Bronx, it's more of a, like an arts community center. Freedom. So, so that's the, uh, the annotated story of Andrew Friedman, who lived on Tower Hill and Red Bank, and the plot to take over the National League took place in Tower Hill. Oh, and by the way, Andrew Friedman, among his activities, uh, was a member of the Deal Golf Club. And a, local, a local interest him. So now we get to the third presentation, um, and that is the story of the origins of baseball. Of course, we all know that Abner Doubleday invented baseball, right? Of course. So this picture never even occurred. I figure it's kind of, kind of interesting. So, <coughs> baseball, basically, knowing about the um, Abner Doubleday myth, which was actually promoted heavily by this guy to sell a sporting equipment, passed the torch along to him, to Alexander Cartwright who was one of the players of the New York Knickerbockers, and um, you may know him as the umpire for the June 19, 1846 game in Allegiant Fields, which wasn't the first baseball game. It was just the first baseball game that we have a reasonably accurate record of. And so baseball gave, and part of the origin story, gave him some credit. Now, the person that was responsible for the Doubleday myth and the Cartwright Incorporation was Abraham Mills, A.G. Mills. They, uh, Spalding commissioned Mills to develop the, the story of baseball's origin um, and present it to the public, which is why the Doubleday myth has persisted over so many years. But this guy, who was also a member of the, of the Hall of Fame, um, kind of stood in the way. Henry Chadwick um, was a proponent of baseball evolving and not being invented. Um, and he actually uh, said that there was a big event in 1857 that, would, that he knew about from speaking to what happened was, and this, this actually happened in the past three months, all right, there was a convention in um, 1857 among the local New York baseball clubs. And at that convention, this gentleman here, Doc Adams, Daniel Lucius Doc Adams, who is not a member of the Hall of Fame, but there's a big push to get him in, actually wrote down all the rules of modern baseball. Okay? But that was it was all anecdotal. No one ever saw exactly what it is. And Cartwright had hinted that that information existed, but no one could prove it. Well about four months ago, the estate of this guy, Henry William Grinnell, who was actually a, a, a teammate of um, Cartwright and also Doc Adams, in his estate were these documents. And these documents actually were the actual annotated rules of that convention in January of 1857. And those, they're being analyzed um, by historians as we speak, but the feeling is, is, is that they are actually the actual source documents to the rules of modern baseball, setting the, the base paths, setting the, the rules of uh, nine men to a side um, with uh, three outs, so on and so forth. Cartwright's game in 1846 
didn't have any of that. Again, you just know that it was a recorded, reliable source of the game. But these documents presented by the Grinnell state have given us more evidence that this is where modern baseball, not started, but at least the way we know it, it's almost like this is the this is the, the Bible of it, or the Dead Sea Scrolls. All right, and that brings us to uh, vintage baseball. Like I said, um, Alaire asked me to uh, put together a, a game. This was about three years ago. So we got in touch with uh, the Mid Atlantic Vintage Baseball Association, and I. Um, got together with uh, a couple of their teams and reached out to guys that I formed the team. And uh, we used to be called the Body Iron Boys, but we changed our name to the Bomb Furnace so we could expand our reach um, beyond the lair. And um, things have been going pretty good. So um, we play, this is our rule book. This is Beatles Dime Baseball, which um, spells out the rules of 1864, which is the rules we uh, play by. And this is uh, the game that Lowe's probably saw, the Spirit of the Jerseys. Okay, that's us playing a couple of weeks ago. And this, this is part, part, of the, part of the fun of this is we get to travel all over the place. So we played uh, at Liberty State Park, we played at Governor's Island, um, played out in Pennsylvania, we're on to Harrisburg in a couple of weeks. Um, teams go to Gettysburg, uh, with the, the Allaire story, um, I got in my uh, my research of the story on Allaire and my interaction with the Baseball Hall of Fame um, got enough attention that Allaire actually took an interest in it. The Hall of Fame actually took an interest in it and published an article. Um, but I've also brought uh, some other things, a couple of a couple of books um, that, you know, if you're a baseball historian or you're interested in baseball history, you might want to include in your library. Um, this first one is Baseball in the Garden of Eden, written by John Thorne. Um, he's the uh, official historian for Major League Baseball, and he knows, like, absolutely, he knows absolutely everything. If, if you've ever seen um, the first couple of uh, episodes of Ken Burns Baseball, He's interviewed pretty extensively. And, and then um, another book that actually kind of started the historic baseball trend back in the 60s, and that's The Glory of Their Times. I don't know if any of you have this in your library. This was actually um, published in the um, 1960s. And the story behind this is uh, after Ty Cobb died, um, Lawrence Ritter, who was a, uh, you know, kind of a, you know, obviously a baseball historian realized that, oh my gosh, these players from you know, the early 19th century are going to start dying off. I better start talking to these folks before all the information goes away. So he compiled all of it, put it in a book, and um, any anybody who's interested in historic baseball or wants a, a place to start, this is a great place to a great place to start. There's a CD on that too. There probably is, yeah. yeah. And then, um, I just as a as a curiosity, um, this is uh, John Mac John Montgomery Ward's uh, baseball book. He was um, actually one of he was a he was a baseball player, but he actually was very involved as a uh, really like a, a thorn in the owner in the baseball owner's sides. He was uh, someone who you know with. Late 19th century baseball, there was a lot of uh, a lot of strife in regard to money and teams. It's like I kind of I kind of hinted, um, and he was kind of center to that, and he kind of put out his own book to kind of to go against Spalding and the and the rest of them. He has his own baseball origin story, which is kind of totally wrong. Shit, I brought some the equipment that we use, our bats. Um, these are the actual balls that we use. All right, they're a, they're a lemon peel as compared to the uh, the stitch that you have in a modern baseball. Okay, um, you're welcome to see the difference as a uh, comparison. 
I also brought a replica of an old 1840s, 1850s baseball and to kind of get into some of the stuff that people talk about, about the origins of baseball, I also brought a cricket ball. I also brought our, uh, our home plate. Not, it's, not, it's not as dirty as I'd like it to be. We've got to score a few more runs. But we're on the bases a lot. Are the bats different weights, or are they? The bats are uh, generally they're all they're like 33, 34. They're a little heavier, pretty heavy. a little a little thicker, um, but you know they they work pretty good. There's a whole there's a whole cottage industry that that makes this stuff, as there is in most reenactment communities. You'd be you'd be surprised. And and do the, does the pitcher pitch underhand or? Well, I can yeah I can. Well, you've seen the game. Yeah, you're cheating. So, <laughs> all right. Um, well, actually, since, since you made, let's let's get into the. I don't, I don't want to go too off. Let's let me let me give you an idea of the differences between the 1864 rules and the modern rules. Um, as this gentleman mentioned, um, the pitching is underhand, and that's the way the rules were. And you were not supposed to bring your hand above your waist, right? What happened over time, though, is that players would pull their pants up high and bring what those forward to. And eventually, over time, they used to go from underhand to sidearm to until about, 18, about 1883, they decided that a pitcher can throw the ball any way he wanted. And then you had players like Amos Rusi who threw the ball so fast that they actually moved the pitcher's plate from 45 feet to 60 feet. So, so that's one of the differences too is the fact that the pitching the pitching was uh, pitcher was closer. Russ, can you talk about the uniforms uh, yeah. in, the, in the beginning? I think you told me they didn't have uniforms. Well, they didn't. Right, they didn't. They didn't have. Okay, yeah, they didn't have. Um, well, they dressed like. <coughs> Baseball was considered a recreational activity, um, a club activity. Um, so, and you didn't really have sporting goods as we, uh, as as you know it. So, the Knickerbockers and, and teams like the Monmouth Furnace actually are our uniforms are more. They look more like regular clothes. I mean, as a as an accommodation to the 19th century. We wear a tie, we call it a cravat, okay? Some of the teams wear shields, and the reason why they wear shields is that a lot of, uh, a lot of baseball clubs back in the 19th century were actually uh, civic organizations, most likely a fire department, and fire departments used to have the, probably look at old uh, pictures of firemen, they have the shield, well the baseball players were firemen, or somewhat associated with that type of thing, so they had the they had the shield. Um, the pants were, you know, generally just just trousers. Um, you know, our, our guys tend to hike them up a little bit, so it's you know it's a little more stylish. Um, the hats were very, as you can see, were very plain. It wasn't really until the 20th century that you started to get emblems, and even that. Like, See on this hat, the emblem is just very, very basic. Not even, you know, not stitched in or anything like that. Um, oh, what were the positions on a team? What were the positions? Yeah. Well, there was there initial. Well, back in the eighteen um, eighteen forties, eighteen fifties, there was actually no um, there was no limit. Um, typically, teams would go out there with seven, 11, 12 guys. Eventually, they settled on eight. And it was eight aside. But what happened was, is you had a baseman, your three outfielders, and your pitcher, so that's eight. Well, basically, what happened was, is they realized that they wanted to try to make the game more attractive to watch, but also um, make it more elegant. So they decided to add the shortstop. And actually, 
Don Adams claims that he invented the shortstop position. And initially, the shortstop position was just that. He was short between the infield and the outfield, almost like a rover. But eventually, it evolved over to where we know the positions are today. Um, one big difference, and actually one of the reasons why we play by the 1864 rules, is on a fly ball, all right, you're allowed to let it bounce once. And it's an out. In 1865, they made it so you had to catch the ball on the fly. All right. Now, the reason why we, we do this is, quite frankly, if one of the, one of the things about playing vintage baseball is it's a lot different than playing um, like recreation softball or anything like that. We, we play whatever the rules were and with, there's no restrictions. So we want to try to include as many people as we can. Our, the teams are constructed of people who are, who are you know, pure athletes and you have a team constructed you know, you have teams that have pure historians. And then there's a bunch of people in the middle. So you want to kind of include everybody. So what vintage baseball, which has really become in vogue since the late 1990s, is they settled on the 1864 rules to try to include as many people as possible. Um, and also it adds, a, it adds kind of a quirky feature to the game that, People seem to like. I mean, you may think, oh, you know, because you don't get the ball on the fly, you're not really playing the game the right way. But I'll tell you, you, if if you're gonna be lazy and let the ball bounce, we don't play on perfectly manicured fields. Okay, so when that ball bounces, it goes right, left, and you see some pretty spectacular, pretty spectacular. No, seriously, you see some pretty spectacular plays. And there's guys that you know they're they're good athletes and they make it look really easy. And there's a, a couple of other um, different rules that uh, didn't change until the uh, 1870s, 1880s. Like for example, um, you're not allowed to overrun first base, which creates for some interesting interesting activity around first base. Uh, foul territory is defined a little differently. Um, in the modern game, uh, if you hit the ball um, inside of first and third into the into the outfield, it's a fair ball. Well, um, in, uh, in 1864 rules, or in 19th century rules, fair territory, or a fair ball is defined as when the ball hits the ground the first time. So what, basically what you have is some of the better hitters actually try to do a fair foul, where you guys are from, you've heard of the Baltimore chop, right? So where they take the ball comes in and instead of trying to swing away they chop it down and try to hit the ball backwards so it goes behind the catcher or conceivably even behind the backstop so you can imagine if you do it the right way what that can lead to and then a really interesting rule that all the new players get to is um, getting back to your base after a foul ball the uh, in the modern game you've probably seen it plenty of times where a ball hit foul, and there's a base runner, and he's taken off, and he realizes it's foul, and he turns around and just kind of takes his time going back to his base. Well, in the mid-19th century, you had what's called pitcher's poison, which meant that um, on a foul ball, you were obliged to get back to your base as quickly as possible. Now, like I said, the the uh, the team we play. Uh, all over the uh, all over New Jersey, um, Pennsylvania, New York. There's teams in New England, teams in Northern Virginia, um, Maryland. The teams on um, we're on Facebook. Um, that's pretty much the extent of it right now. Um, I'm kind of uh, you know, each team is a is an independent operation. Um, so I'm kind of building up the resources to uh, you know give us a. Uh, like a web presence and be able to, to raise funds for things. Um, you know, the, the bottom line, as far as the as far as the team is concerned, and what I'm trying to do is, I do believe that uh, you know that the history of baseball 
in this area in the 19th century, um, and this as a whole, baseball is kind of a, ref a reflection of the culture, and um, it kind of defines what um, you know what America and society was about in the 19th century. And it just, it, there's just so much stuff that's just that's just just buried under the surface that if you bring out, I mean, it's not just about baseball; it just kind of tells you about what what life was like. Yes. Two questions. Yeah. The heaviest bat was what, 36? This is like a, th yeah, these are these are 34s, but yes, yeah, so some guys have, some guys use 36. What wood, were they made out of ash or what, like present bats or what kind of wood? They were like, like yeah, like ash and maple and you know, all kinds of stuff, whatever you had your hands on, yeah. As a matter of fact, I, I forgot it. I, I have it at home and I wish I had brought it. Um, when I played town ball, we actually, use a bat that's very, very thin, and it resembles the spokes of a wagon wheel, and that's by design, because that's one of the things they used, were, were spokes. Oh, and oh, by the way, the, the bats, you notice the stripes on the bat? That was a custom of the um, mid-19th century. You typically painted your bat, your team colors, and our team color is black, so that's why the bats have the, the black stripes. So, you know, teams that have red and blue, or red or green, whatever, they have stripes representing the team. Any other questions? You don't, play, you don't use baseball gloves? Oh, no, no gloves. No gloves. Gloves, glo gloves, gloves, were, gloves weren't used um, until the 1870s, and then only for catchers. And also, one of the things they did is the you know, anecdotally, I've heard that the first gloves they used, they tried to make it, you know, flesh colored, so it looked like they weren't wearing gloves. <laughs> but you didn't really see gloves until the 1880s. And you know, I mentioned Jack Dunn. Um, actually, there was uh, you guys heard of Ryan Sandberg, right? Second baseman for the Cubs. Okay. He in his career, he you know, one of the reasons why he. So Hall of Famers, he broke a lot of fielding records. And some of the fielding records that he broke were used to belong to a guy named Bid McPhee. Bid McPhee played second base with his bare hands until almost 1900. So, you know, and, and his records, I mean, again, yeah, this is a guy who played an infield position barehanded and had fielding records that stood essentially. So, but it, was, so it really wasn't until the late 19th century where everyone wore gloves and you know, you've probably seen the pictures, the gloves weren't that big and it wasn't really until the, um, the you know, late 40s and 50s where the, the webbing got, got bigger and so forth. Any other questions? Yeah. What were the baseballs made of? The baseballs were made of, um, were made of leather with uh, India, an India rubber core and thread. So you're, you know, you're welcome after the presentation to take a look at these, throw them. Well, I'll throw them too far. <laughs> but um, and you know, compare them, compare them with the modern baseball, compare them with the with the cricket ball, which I would not want to be hit with a cricket ball. Okay, Russ. Thank you so much. Thank you. Historical Museum, and right now we welcome you to have refreshments and talk to Russ personally. Uh, he's a great guy to take us out to the ball game, so enjoy spring baseball. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.